I am so glad to have in the studio Audrey. Audrey's back. Audrey, I invited Audrey to come in and join us because there's a big event coming up. There certainly is. And and there I've been hearing is. about this wonderful dinner that you're planning and it's a it's a hundred and fortieth anniversary of people being uh, Portuguese on Maui, correct? Yeah, being the immigration began um of Portuguese to Hawaii in eighteen seventy-eight. Wow. And on September twenty ninth, the first group of Portuguese settlers arrived here aboard the ship Priscilla following a voyage of a hundred and twenty days. If you can imagine I being, can't imagine being at sea for a hundred and twenty days. Without a spa. Without <laughs> without a spa. Without without a lot of things. <laughs> Travel back then was not comfortable or convenient. So it was... Um, where, where did they leave from? They came from the island of Madeira, mm. which was the first group. The first two groups came from Madeira. The third ship came from the Azores. It brought the first Azorean Portuguese over. Wow. This is... I mean, when you think about 140 years, and, and I'm sure you love your history, and you are very tied in with the Portuguese community here on Maui. And and you worked hard to actually develop where the dinner's going to be happening. Right. Which right. is right there on Baldwin Avenue. At Heritage Hall, right. Mm-hmm. And we have, our room capacity is 116, and right now I have 108 people. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> but th- that's in the hall. Uh-huh. There are another 20 in Suite 101. The entertainers will, because we do have um, a hula halau. Mm-hmm. We have... Um, Filipino dancers. We have one Chinese dancer, and I really, really need somebody to represent the Japanese community. And oh, you got to talk to Deidre. I have. That's right. I can call her over at Nisei yeah, Veterans. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what's missing. But we have a group coming in from California, originally from Portugal. They now live in the Bay Area, and they will be doing fado. We have a 12-string guitar, the Portuguese traditional guitar, and it's shaped like a teardrop. Mm-hmm. It is. And, you And know, I've studied that because yeah. I watched up. I was going to go to the Portugal thing, and so, I mean, it's an amazing poetic um, form of expression, which is very unique it to is. Portugal. We should tell people that's not this Saturday, but the following Saturday, the, the 29th. 29th. Right. And exactly, 140 years. We have our, the Consul General of Portugal in San Francisco as our keynote speaker. Oh, wonderful. We have the Director of, let me see if I can get it correct, Portuguese Overseas Communities, uh, Dr. Paulo Tevis coming in. Uh, it's, we have the Mayor of Kauai is going to be able to join us. I'm, and, of course, our mayor is going to be issuing a proclamation oh. you know, recognizing the day. So it's so a big, big deal. It's a big, big deal. And <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, dear, we're cooking for 150 people <laughs> because we hope they'll have seconds. Um, it's it's really going to be quite an, quite an affair. We have both Portuguese and Hawaiian foods. We've got Kalua pig. And my cousin was kind enough to donate the poi. All 40 pounds of wow, it. Wow, 40 pounds of poi. <laughs> oh, right, right. Wow. Um, and we have haupia. We have, um, from Portugal, we've got bacalhau a gomes de sa. What's that? It's a codfish casserole with eggs and potatoes, um, garlic and onions. Uh, you know, this is mandatory in Portuguese. <laughs> we, and so uh, we have we have that. It's a baked casserole. We have a catra, which is um, from... Actually, it's from the island of Terceira in the Azores. And that, of course, is beef that is baked in clay pots with wine and mm. garlic and Sounds onion. very traditional. And, oh, <laughs> delicious. <laughs> yeah. And then we also have, let me see, um, hmm, we've got uh, bread that we have made in our stone oven. We'll be offering that. We have, oh, for dessert. In addition to Halpia, we have a chocolate mousse with a lilikoi sauce. Oh, that sounds wonderful. It sounds sinful. It does sound <laughs> sinful. My gosh. 
So, so this is if anyone wants to go, they got a. There's only a couple seats left. Yeah, I've, got, mean, I've got eight seats left, and that's it. Well, people better get on this. I mean, because it, it's going to be one of those things where everyone's going to be talking about this. It's a big, 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 it is, big celebration. It is a big celebration. How do people get on board? They call Heritage Hall. They call the Portuguese Association. We're at Heritage Hall. Our number is two four three zero zero six five, and they ask to speak to Audrey or they leave a message saying, hey, we need, we need to come and we can, we can work that out. Well, let's talk a little bit about the history. Um, and again, it's so unique and it's such a part, an integral part of this island um, because the Portuguese brought um, uh, it, their own culture. They did. And their own lifestyle and their values to, to Maui. They did. And they, I think when you look at Hawaii that we live in today, there are the influences of so many different cultures, and we seem to have adopted, I think, the best of all worlds. When you look at the Japanese, they have a tremendous sense of community, mm -hmm. and they are wonderful in keeping us together. When you look at the Hawaiian community that was probably, um, you know, stunned by the arrival of the Portuguese who were totally, totally different, didn't speak their language. But as people got to be with each other, they found there were far more similarities than differences. And then when you add the Chinese influence and you add the, the Puerto Ricans that came, the Spanish that came, the Norwegians that came, not um, many people talk about the Norwegians that came. That's but they, interesting. They were a very interesting group because uh -huh. there was one low that came, and they were hired by the plantation, and they went to work. And on payday, they were paid by a number. And then you see in the pay records this day where none of them showed up to work. And the next paycheck, they all have names. Wow. They were willing to take a day's cut in pay to be recognized as individuals with Rather names. Rather than a number. Correct. Isn't that interesting? Let's talk a little bit about what the Portuguese brought to Maui. They brought, well, the Portuguese in general brought several things. One was at the time that they arrived, there was a very tiny um, Catholic community. Mm. And this was because um, Queen Ka'ahumanu really did not want Catholics. She I was, didn't know She that. was a Protestant. I knew she was Protestant, but I yes. didn't know that she, she didn't want did Catholics. She did not want the Catholics. And they we had have to go back to history now. At that yeah. time in Europe, there was all in England huge battles between the Protestants and also the Church of England mm -hmm. and the Catholics, and it was, a, it was a very big issue then. Yes, and she was very um, respectful to the Protestant minister, uh, missionaries that had come. So when the Catholics arrived, they had a very difficult time. And mm -hmm. at one point, they um, the kingdom expelled the priests but kept the brothers and then as time went on they allowed the priests to come back but the Portuguese this was their faith mm -hmm. and when they came you see the rise of the Catholic Church in Hawaii mm. where the priests who were primarily from Belgium and other countries came in and built churches, including Damien, who built... I was just thinking of know, Damien. Exactly. Yeah, he built churches. Because he on, was from Belgium. He was from Belgium, and he built churches on Molokai, not only at Kalaupapa, but at, on Molokai topside. Um, you look at the history there, but the Portuguese brought a very strong faith. They also had a very strong work ethic. So when we look at just going back to the church... Mm -hmm. um, the beautiful round church up there in Kula. in Kula, that was from the Portuguese influence. That that yes, church was that, and particularly the Azorians, um, they, the people of the Azores have a very strong devotion to the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and that is their protector. They're located on a earthquake fault line, so the Azores suffer some terrible earthquakes. Aha. Uh -huh. And they had one on January 1st, 1980, that killed several people. So the Holy Spirit is really their, um, their protector, mm -hmm. and they, they are very devoted to him. And wherever there are Azarians, you're going to find a little church similar to the one we have in Kula. Interesting. 
because they will always build their chapels because in every little village, on every island, there are nine islands in the Azores, they have a chapel that is devoted strictly to the Holy Spirit. I did not know that. That's very interesting. Now, of course, we know in Europe, uh, Mother Mary is very mm-hmm. um, extremely. Mm-hmm. And, of course, if you go to Portugal, and the, you go to the, Fatima, Fatima is, right. is, is, is very much present, the devotion to Mother right. Mary. But I was not aware of the Holy Spirit connection as yep. well. It's and very interesting. It's um, someone, and I believe it was a Jesuit priest, told me that um, at at one point, Rome became very concerned because Rome believes, of course, that Easter is a major holiday in the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And here these people in the Azores are far more interested in the Holy Spirit. And um, Rome wanted them to, you know, hey, tone it down. You can (laughs) pray to the Holy Spirit. But, you know, there are more uh, holidays that are more important. Well, apparently, word of the um, letter from Rome reached the Azores before the letter did. And so when the letter arrived, they never opened it. And therefore, they could say honestly that they did not read any instruction. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I I, I thought thought that was very clever. Oh, okay. So, well, I interrupted you because I just was trying to figure out those connections with the churches here. And and you explained that beautifully. And you were going to say next about other influences. that The The other influences that we had, um, the Portuguese, of course, brought their foods. Of course. And as a result... um, Malasales, for example, that used to be made only once a year, um, you buy every day, and it's popular. I just wish people would spell it correctly. Maui News does, and that's because uh, of the Let's grammar. spell it correctly. M-A-L-A-S-S-A-D-A. Oh, two S's. Yeah, it's got a double S. I didn't know that. Because it comes from the verb asar, which means to bake or to roast. And the dough for malasales was, uh, really did not work well for baking or roasting, but it's wonderful fried. Uh So um, there, which has nothing to do with it, but they (laughs) brought something even more important. They brought an instrument, a musical instrument. The ukulele. It was, when it arrived here, it was the braguinha. Was it called what? A braguinha. I didn't know that. If it's a little bit bigger instrument, it's a cavequinho. But whether you call it a braguinha or a the ukulele of Hawaii is patterned on this Portuguese instrument. Jumping fleas, right? That's the translation of ukulele. Uh-huh. And it's because it's a very portable instrument, you can take it with you. It is, yeah. Um, and it is now the most readily identified sound for Hawaiian music. It is, and, and people... T- you s- you go in a waiting room at the airport, there's always someone who has an ukulele and brings it out, you know, and it's so cool. If you go up to the Iao Valley, someone there has an ukulele, exactly. you know, and, and and it just is something you carry along with you, right? I mean, it's, right. it is, and it is, ident- and it's spread across the world now. I yes. mean, it's huge, you know. And, of course, you know, the Portuguese did bring that. Um, they brought so many other things, though, with them. They brought a strong sense of family. Mm. And family values. Um, families were all important. And I can understand why, because families are the first to see you when you're born. They're the last to be with you when you die. Mm-hmm. So these are just part of the things that make up the Portuguese person. And it must have been so much more so when they first came over in the 1800s, and they only had themselves, their language, and their community and they must have all been brought together and uh, had to be su- supporting and, and, and taking care of each they other here, right? They had to take care of each other because they didn't, they first of all did not speak the language here. And the language at the time was both Hawaiian and English, with Hawaiian really more predominant. Mm. So they had to learn Hawaiian and they had to learn English, and many of them did not. Mm. However, their children went to school, made friends with other children, and became the interpreters for their families. Now, what was the originating uh, force that brought the Portuguese to Maui? First of all, it was sugar. And we had at the time a Portuguese consul named Jacinto Pereira, and everybody called him Jason Perry, which I think was easier to say. 
um, he recognized the growth of the sugar industry in Hawaii and said, you know, on the island of Madeira, they've grown sugar cane since 1820, and they had their own mill since, um, I'm sorry, since 1420. Wow. And they had their own mill since 1452, so they knew something about sugar. Aha. Uh-huh. And um, that didn't go very far, but Dr. Hillebrand, who was a medical doctor and took care of the royal family, um, was sent on a trip to find laborers, and when he realized what the Portuguese had as far as a knowledge of cane, sugar cane, he, of course, advocated for them to come. And realizing at the time that Hawaii was a kingdom, as was Portugal, the hmm. protocols that were drawn up between the Kingdom of Portugal and the Kingdom of Hawaii and signed off by their prime ministers in both cases allowed for the Portuguese to come to Hawaii where they were given the same treatment as native Hawaiians. Interesting. And, of course, being the Azores and the islands, they were around something that they could relate to as far as island islands, living. exactly. And people who grow up on islands and who live on islands I think have a greater sensitivity to where they are. They know that some things are limited. The only thing that's unlimited in an island is possibility. Mm -hmm. Now, because it was the workers who were coming over, did they bring their wives and families? They they did. The first ship that came had 66 men. I want to say they had 30 some they had 36 children and wow. I think 24 women there were 123 Can you roughly. imagine that going through all of that for was a what you said 100 and how many days 120 100, days 120 days with the families oh my gosh and the kids oh. four months at sea wow wow and that was some rough water that they were covering yes yes there were <laughs> they had to come around the cape my so gosh amazing. the storms were amazing they were horrible now, did some of these Portuguese also have the influences? And had they been Paniolos? Had they been um, riding and 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 using the, the the horses for for any kind of purposes there? Not so much in the not so much in Madeira, more so in the Azores. But the Azores also had a tremendous dairy industry. Interesting, and they make the best butter in Europe. Uh-huh. In the Azores, I didn't know that. And cheese and all these other wonderful things. Uh huh. Of course, we never had a lot of dairy. There was one or two, but we haven't had a lot. It's it's a lot of work, and but we do up country. There were you know dairies. That, oh yeah, Haleakala yeah. dairy yeah, was yeah. you know, and there were other uh, smaller dairies. And in fact, there were dairies. Haleakala Haleakala's processing plant, I believe it was, was on what is now Dairy Road. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, Which explains yeah. Dairy Road. Mm-hmm. And I, you know what? I never put the two and two together before. I always wondered what it was called someday Dairy Road. You, someday you should talk with Mr. Peter Baldwin, who has such a wonderful recollection of the dairy industry here, in Hawaii, here uh-huh. in Maui. Well, I heard the stories about how they had to get the cows off the island and fly uh, them off on a special charter well, plane to, when they, the cows were finally going and moving over to Oahu. Oahu yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But before then, they would um, actually swim the cattle to Kaho Olave. Really? Yeah, before the Second World War when the wow. military took over the island for target practice. Wow. They would swim the cattle over, and from there they would barge them to Oahu. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, so we're seeing that there's like this been... Of course, now we look at the Portuguese, and they're still so family-oriented. Um, large families all gathering together, and, of course, people have a chance to experience that. Um, because, And the Portuguese can talk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they usually know what they're saying. And they usually <laughs> not always. <laughs> and you, you speak so beautifully, but... But, you know, when you have a gathering like this, like you're going to have on the 29th there uh, at the Heritage Hall, it's it's such an event that it's going to be, I guess, a lot of pride, but a lot of talking and a lot of, um, a lot of family feeling, right? There is a lot of family feeling. But look at our families today. Mm-hmm. Um, there are very few families that are pure Portuguese. Mm-hmm. Um, all of us seem to have... Um, you know, family that is of all different ethnic backgrounds. Mm-hmm. 
And the thing that we wanted to do for Heritage Hall, for the, for the children of the future, not only for the Portuguese, but equally for the Puerto Ricans, was to make sure there would be a place where they could come to see something about their culture, to see and to understand, to feel and to touch things that came from Portugal or from Puerto Rico. That was our aim, and we have achieved it. Now, what's your personal history, your Portuguese history, uh, of coming here and, and, and your family at Roots? My grand, my grandfather, um, Antonio Rodrigues Rocha, arrived in 1886. Wow, not that long after. No, not that long. It was after. like maybe a generation and a half, two generations after. No, the first, the, the first ones came in 1878, and he came and in 1886, years eight yeah. years later. Wow. Um, and so, what drew in the next, like your your great grandfather? Again, what? it was it was the opportunity to work. Mm-hmm. And um, that sh- in sugar, which was something that in Madeira, even at the time, they realized that they would no longer be able to produce sugar because sugar was already being grown in Brazil, where they oh. they could plant plantations the size of Madeira. So uh-huh. the people of Madeira saw that there would be a limit to what they could do. And because this is what they knew, for my grandfather, who was a sugar boiler, he was not a field laborer. He was a sugar boiler. Uh-huh. Today, it's all done with computers. At a precise temperature, they will stop boiling. But back then, it was by sight, by feel, by experience that you knew this is as much as you need to boil, stop. And he was able to do that. If you didn't, if you didn't know what you were doing, um, you could ruin a whole batch of sugar. Uh Uh-huh. So this was very precise work, and that was what he did. Um, That was on my father's side. My father was um, a year and a half old when they left, and he he actually made two after they arrived. Um, A few years after they arrived, his mother died. And my grandfather had now two children, a little girl and my father. And he needed to marry someone. And so he looked around, and there was a woman who was a distant relative of his who already had a child. Uh, she had a little girl who was out of, uh, had it out of wedlock. My grandfather married her, brought up her, her daughter, and she in turn took care of my aunt and my father. Hmm. And uh, together they went on to have six more children. So wow. families were young. Yeah families were very large. Mm -hmm. On my mother's side, her parents were actually married in Brazil. Both of them had gone to work, and they were in Brazil. And doing sugar work. In sugar. Wow. And uh, they were very ill-treated. So one night in the middle of the night, they packed up their little families, and six families from Madeira hiked through the jungle to the nearest seaport where they got on a boat and went back to Madeira. Wow. There was nothing for them in Madeira. The island had too many people for the square footage. And so you had cases where there was starvation. Um, it It was really difficult. And then the opportunity to work in sugar in Hawaii came up. In Brazil, they at least spoke the same language. Uh huh. Here they were willing to get on a mm. boat to come some uh, come somewhere where no one spoke their language, but they got on the boat. Um, at the when they came, my grandparents had four children, and their youngest child died when they reached Honolulu mm. of German measles that did not break out, and she just ran a fever and she died pointing to the water because she was so hot. In any case, they arrived with four children, and this was in 1906. My mother was three. Wow. So they grew up here, Mm -hmm. and they went to school here. My father only went to the third grade. Then he had to go to work. My mother was able to go to the sixth grade, but they couldn't afford to send her for more schooling. So she went to work in the fields um, until she had a chance to go to work as a teacher's aide at Hamakua Poco School. So when the sugar industry ended, not that long ago, no, there was really a lot of heritage of the, from the Portuguese side that was over as well, which I really was not aware of. Yeah, 
Wow. Well, we're just, we have a minute left. I mean, I can talk to you, Audrey. <laughs> we're planning another trip to Portugal. Yes, we are. Yes, and we are. going to the Azores. We learned our, and Madeira. And Madeira. And St. Christopher Island? Or Saint, another St. Michael Island. San Miguel. San yes. Miguel. Oh, yes. yeah. The most beautiful island in the world. And and Kathy Takushi is going to be uh, giving us information. We're going to be putting that out there real soon. But we learned our lesson the first time. We said, we got to go to the place where the Portuguese roots are from. Right, Kathy? That's right. <laughs> so, uh, so with Colette Travel, we're planning that for next year. And we're excited about that. And we're going to be talking more about that. I could just talk to you all, obviously. I just love listening to you talk, Audrey. You have such a wealth of knowledge. Um, those few last seats to your Heritage Hall Portuguese 140th anniversary dinner next Saturday, the 29th. Call again. What number? 243-0065. 243-0065. This is going to be a, um, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to really enjoy, except the 150th is going to be huge, too. Well, I may uh, not be I, here. That's I, I, think you, <laughs> <laughs> I think you will. And, it, and it's always such a treat to have you. And thank you, Kathy. You can call Kathy Takushi for information on Portugal and anything else at 244-1414, Captivating Journeys. And until next time... Happy trails to everyone, and use the Travel Angel Guide to keep your head about you when you travel. (laughs) 